Hey, Davey here, host of the Found Podcast. So, a few years ago, a woman named Lori found a piece of paper in her front yard. It had stormed the day before, and the wind had blown some papers and trash onto her lawn. This piece of paper, it was covered in handwriting, kids' handwriting, and it said at the top, Adventure Club. You can actually see the piece of paper on the Found Podcast Facebook page or the Found app. So at the top it says Adventure Club, and then it says how to get into the club. You need to know how to climb a fence. You need to like adventure. And then it's got the rules. Number one, no messing up the club. Number two, don't bring anything in without permission from Shane or Ethan. Number three, you have to be nice to squirrels. And number four, you can't tell anyone where or what the club is. So this woman, Lori, she thought she might know who Shane and Ethan were, just a couple of kids from her neighborhood. So a few days later, she went up to them on the street and started reciting all these top secret rules. The kids were shocked. Like, how does she know all this classified information? She told them that her dog, named Kismet, had overheard them making up the rules. The kids were speechless. And as they were walking away, she heard one of them say to the other, Whoa, Kismet heard us. (laughs) Years have passed, but Lori still likes to imagine that those kids have been completely secretive around any dogs after that. This week on Found, we look at the magic of finding. The way notes, letters, photos, and other found items have the power to change us, change the way we see the world, and spark connections between us and the people around us. Back with more in just a moment. It was in my driveway. I found it in the trash. In the middle of a library book. On the windshield of my car. From Found the Musical, Killer Films Media, and Wondery, this is Found. I'm Davey Rothbard. So I have some really exciting news to share with you guys. Um, Every once in a while, you've heard me talk about the Found musical, which has a bunch of actual Found notes and letters in it. It's also loosely inspired by my life and how me and a couple of my friends created Found magazine. It's this trippy thing having a musical made about Found, you can imagine. And this is a legit production. Like, it played off-Broadway a couple years ago and got a really nice review in the New York Times, and now it's playing at the Philadelphia Theater Company starting November 9th. So... I have a couple of the found cast members here with me today. First, we have F. Michael Haney. F. was in the Broadway production of Wicked and also Holler If You Hear Me, which was inspired by the writings of Tupac Shakur. In the found musical, F. actually plays me, Davey, which is kind of crazy. What's up, F.? Hey, how you doing? I'm going to have to start practicing your voice now. <laughs> well, I just think, like, really low baritone, really sexy, <laughs> um, very white. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and uh, and uh, also here with us is, is Christina Anthony, who you guys have heard on episode one and two of the show. She's been on Key and Peele. She's part of the Second City Improv Troupe. And she's in some of my favorite scenes in the Found Musical. What's up, Christina? How you doing? Hey, Davey. I'm doing great. <laughs> right on. Well, let's do this. Christina, would you do us honors? Tell us who's in the play. So um, as Denise, we have Alicia DeLaRue. She was in Beautiful. She was in Sister Act on Broadway. But also she was in a little show called Hamilton. I can't wait to meet Alicia um, because I'm going to have her teach me Hamilton on the breaks. (laughs) Uh, um, Next join in the cast as Mikey D is Juwan Crowley. Now, Juwan also has a Hamilton kind of connection. He's in Spamilton right now. I saw him on the cover of the New York Times art section last week. Uh, there was a picture of him for Spamilton, which sounds kind of incredible in its own right. Oh, I heard it is a pitch-perfect parody of Hamilton. And F, hey, before we go on, F, do you know I have a connection to Hamilton, too? Oh, tell me. Well, okay, so Alicia was in Hamilton. Jawan is in Spamilton, a parody of Hamilton. I actually tried to buy tickets to Hamilton, and my credit card was declined. <laughs> All right. Well, there you have it. Yep. So, you know, just know we'll probably be our own little group, but we'll also socialize with everyone. Absolutely. 
Listen, I did holler if you hear me with Chris Jackson, who won't give me tickets to Hamilton, so maybe I can be in the club as well. Okay, cool beans. <laughs> and, and, and my question is, is there a parody yet in the works of Spamilton? Ooh, that's meta. I don't, I don't know if the musical theater community is ready for an Inception-style, like, three-tiered. <laughs> All right, playing the role of Becca will be Erica Hennison, and she was in Les Mis, and I'm telling you, if you like that legit Broadway realness... Erica's going to be bringing it, so please be in the house. All right, and let's introduce the ensemble. Orville Mendoza, he's worked with Stephen Sondheim three different productions. He's also an original cast member in the show Roadshow. And he's a Barrymore Award winner and Drama Desk Award nominee. Let's move on to Andrew Call. Andrew was an American idiot on Broadway. He was also in Rock of Ages. But I think Andrew, to me, his coolest credit is he was sunny in Grease Live. Did you catch Grease Live? I did see it. And, yeah, it was really awesome, actually. And they just won that Emmy the other night. Right on. Who else? Graham Stevens is going to be joining us in the ensemble. He was recently in The Robber Bridegroom off-Broadway. Molly Pope... Neo Retro Downtown Cabaretus. If that all ran past your brain and you didn't get that, let me just tell you do you like Liza Minnelli? Do you like cabaret shows? You're going to love Molly. <laughs> She's awesome. um, and then also, I can't fail to mention Sandy Rustin. Sandy is a playwright. She wrote this amazing show called Rated P for Parenthood. But most notable, she wrote the show called The Cottage, which I heard might be going to Broadway. Awesome. She's really talented. Oh, so in every great. Way. And also, amazing singer, crazy great comedian. And I have to just say, personally, she is a MILF you can trust. <laughs> I'm telling you, if my husband spent the night at Sandy's house, I would be fine with it because all she's going to do is bring him soup. (laughs) And I don't even have a husband, but she knows what I mean. (laughs) Okay, and then also I will be in the show, people. Yes, and Christina, you're you're amazing. You're so you're so great in the show, and I'm just so thrilled that you're back for more. And guys, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, absolutely. Hey, Davey, I'll catch you next time. All right, you guys rock. So you can see the new found musical starting November 9th at the Philadelphia Theater Company with Christina and F and music from Eli Bolin, who does the original music you've heard on the podcast. Hope to see all of you there. Now, for a lot of us, life can be pretty ordered and routine. We go to school, go to work, spend time with family and friends. And even if we're outgoing and gregarious, maybe we don't interact with strangers that often or have the chance to explore lives beyond the ones we know. A found note or letter, or photograph, well, it can change all that, break our routine. Something as simple as a stranger's to-do list can become a window into another person's life and propel our own lives into some new, unexpected direction. This week on Found, the magic of finding. On other episodes, we examine one mysterious find and explore the story behind it, sometimes even tracking down the person who wrote it. But this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. We'll hear the stories of four people who have found something and learn how their discoveries changed their day or even changed their life. Before we get started, just a little note. There's a couple of unbleeped swear words in this episode. Just a heads up if you're listening with kids. So our first story, sent to us by one of our listeners, involves a couple of finds. One is a cassette tape, and the other, well, I won't give it away, but let me just say that neither of these finds are quite what we think they are at first. Kyle Kinane is going to read this story for us. He's a comedian in L.A. You've probably seen him or heard him before. He's the voice of Comedy Central. Here's Kyle with The Cigarette Curse. I used to take smoke breaks in the alley behind the building where I worked. From time to time, I'd run into another guy who smoked in the same alley. His name was Joe, and he lived in an apartment building down the street. We'd strike up a conversation for five minutes and be done. Then I wouldn't see him again for another two or three months. I didn't know his last name or really much about him, but he always seemed like an okay dude, and he had a cool, old-school, copper-colored lighter. One day, we're smoking in the alley when Joe sizes me up and asks if I can help him move the next morning. I have a car, and apparently he doesn't. No problem, I tell him. Curious for whatever peak inside his life I'm now likely to get. The next morning, I go up to his third floor apartment. 
Joe tells me his old roommate just split a month ago, and he shows me a door with huge chunks carved out of the wood, forming strange, mysterious symbols. He says the roommate was into voodoo and Satanism, and the two of them parted on really bad terms. We walked into the roommate's old room, and the walls are completely covered in incomprehensible graffiti. There are more hack marks in the drywall, and all the furniture is gutted and overturned. On the floor is a cassette tape with a handwritten label, Wu-Tang Forever. At some point, I must have mentioned to Joe how much I love cassettes, because he sees me looking at it and says, Go on, man, it's yours. I shove it in my pocket. Thanks. We walk over to Joe's room, which is full of boxes, and I help him clear it out, hauling the boxes down to the car a couple at a time, leaving his bed for last. When we lift up his mattress, there's a single cigarette sitting on the box spring underneath it, right below where Joe's head would have been when he was sleeping. He reaches down, picks it up, and brings it close to his face, squinting. I get closer too, and I can see there's like multiple lines of text scrawled along the length of the cigarette in teeny tiny red letters. The first line says, your life will be misery for as long as you sleep on this. And that's just the first. There's all kinds of other foreboding prophecies. Things like, your life will be shit and I'll have the last laugh. We stand peering at the cigarette, slowly twisting it around until we've read the whole thing. Some kind of treacherous witchcraft on the part of his old roommate. A cigarette curse. The most spooky and surprising thing is the voodoo roommate's immaculate, perfectly neat penmanship. A guy with handwriting so incredibly precise is a guy you gotta watch out for. But the voodoo dude was long gone, so I suppose in an attempt to have the last laugh himself, Joe, he actually laughs. A big hearty laugh. Then he puts the cigarette in his mouth, fires up his lighter, and gives me a badass grin. But then, right as he takes his first puff, his eyes go wide, and he drops the cigarette suddenly to the ground, shrieking. He's inconsolable, clutching his face, rolling around on the floor, screaming and cursing. Later, after Joe eventually recovers, his eyes still red and teary, he sputters three words. Dipped in mace. So... If you've ever wondered what happens to your esophagus and lungs if you smoked a cigarette soaked in mace, well, now you know. I don't recommend it. We finish loading his things into my car. Joe runs up for one last trip, comes back down, and wordlessly, gently, places an enormous handgun on the floor in my back seat. Then he asks if we could stop to pick up a new kitten for his girlfriend. And after I dropped him off that evening, I never saw Joe again. One more funny coda to the story. A few weeks later, I popped that Wu-Tang Forever tape into my tape player. But it wasn't Wu-Tang Forever. It was two guys freestyle rapping over instrumental beats. Almost inconceivably, he was apparently a worse rapper than he was as a roommate. I crossed out Wu-Tang Forever on the label and I wrote a new one. Smoking Mace. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Wow, and I thought my old roommate was bad because every morning he pressed the snooze button five times. All right, that was Kyle Kinane reading a story sent to us by a listener of the show who asked to remain anonymous. I think they're trying to avoid getting a voodoo curse himself. Keep an eye out for Kyle's new Comedy Central special premiering on October 15th called Loose in Chicago. Sometimes a find is not what you think it is at first. A cassette tape, a cigarette, and then sometimes the way you react to a found letter is maybe not what the person who wrote it intended. Jenny Owen Youngs is a musician who has crisscrossed the country many times on tour. Her found story takes place on one of these road trips. By the time I got to Cleveland, I had been touring solo through the Midwest for about a week. Although the audiences had been lovely and the city's fair, driving across American turnpikes all alone had left me feeling pretty drained. My behavior, too, was growing loopier. Desperate for companionship, I had laid my lonely heart at the feet of mainstream country radio. I was rewarded with Brad Paisley asserting his masculinity, even if he did walk my sissy dog, 
and Miranda Lambert preparing to beat her freshly paroled abusive husband to the proverbial punch by pumping his unsuspecting face full of lead. Somewhere along the line, I took to calling out, Baggins! Shire! every time I drove past a reasonably attractive bunch of trees. I was totally batty and couldn't wait to get back to Brooklyn. I just had to get through this final night in Seatown, and then I could head home. The gig in Cleveland ended up an example of the niche phenomenon I've come to think of as the sleeper show. One performs before a reserved, seemingly indifferent audience for the length of the set, only to be approached at the merch table by tons of rowdy, enthusiastic people, members, inexplicably, of the same group that seemed to be just barely staying awake for the last hour. The psychological result of playing this kind of show is akin to receiving intensely mixed messages from the sociopath with whom you didn't mean to fall in love. And so, with my brain all swirly and my morale flagging, I rolled wearily out of the venue parking lot toward the hotel around midnight, brain churning out my goal mantra like so. Bed, 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 bed. Cleveland, however, did not want me to sleep. First, I needed to park in front of the hotel lobby. Multiple orbits revealed that all four roads squaring off the block were under construction. The only way to pull into the hotel's loading area required me to spin diagonally into the intersection, brake, and then back up straight for about half a block, weaving between striped cylindrical barricades all the way. Once parked, I approached reception to check in. The clerk's marginal interest in me completely disintegrated when a coworker emerged from a conference room with a steel cart full of untouched catering leftovers. He abandoned ship mid-transaction, leaving the desk to make up a plate of food and forgetting to give me my room number. Eventually, he came back and told me where to sleep. I stashed my gear in the room and hopped back into my car to look for parking. Mr. GPS listed about 10 parking garages within a mile of the hotel. When I drove to the closest one, however, I was greeted by a locked gate and a sign that read, Open 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. No overnight parking. Further investigation revealed that every other garage in the area operated by the same hours. I finally settled on what appeared to be street parking and then fell into the bed at around 1.30. The following morning, I rose at 6, anxious to start heading eastward. I darted into Starbucks to feed my caffeine addiction. It is the one place I can rely on to have soy milk anywhere in America. Except, I quickly learned, Cleveland. I began to unhinge. This city hates me, I thought. I was exhausted, homesick, and now there was no soy milk. I stalked across the street to my car with my black coffee, and that's when I saw it. Tucked under my windshield wiper just so lay a peace offering, though I didn't know it yet, from the city to me. Figuring it was a coupon for a car wash or a tiny flyer for a rave, I picked it up and read, Invitation. You are cordially invited to go fuck yourself. I broke into uncontrollable laughter as I turned the business card over in my hands, wondering who would have such a thing printed up and who would walk around Cleveland between the hours of 1 and 6 in the morning, Johnny Appleseeding tidings of, go fuck yourself. I inspected the other two cars parked on the block, but the angel of death had passed over all but me. The effect the card had on me, though, was perhaps the reverse of what was intended. I felt a strange smile creep over my face. Finally, I hopped in my car, started it, and took off toward the rising sun, toward home. That was the musician Jenny Owen Youngs. She's also the host of the Buffering the Vampire podcast about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You can check out her podcast and her awesome music at JennyOwenYoungs.com. Back with more in just a moment. We all know sleep is important, but consider someone you know who's in the military or a veteran. Imagine how much a good night's sleep means to them. My sleep number setting is 55, and my Sleep IQ score last night was 86. As a sleep number bed owner, it makes me proud to let everyone know that during this month, Sleep Number is honoring our nation's heroes with savings reserved just for them. Now, I've had a lot of friends in the military, and in fact, I used to volunteer at a place called The Last Firebase down in Washington, D.C. It's right next to the Vietnam Wall. And I would work an all-night shift, and sometimes, literally, this is how I would sleep. I would line two coolers up next to each other and sleep across that. The difference between sleeping on two coolers and sleeping in an incredible sleep number bed 
is incredible. Sleep number beds cost about the same as a traditional mattress. They last twice as long, and 91% of their owners recommend one. Come in now for exclusive savings just for military and veterans. Right now, it's the semi-annual sale where you'll find clearance savings of $600 on a Sleep Number P6 mattress with Sleep IQ technology. And if you come in now and you're an active military member or a veteran, you'll find exclusive savings on all mattresses across the board. You'll only find Sleep Number at any one of the 550 Sleep Number stores nationwide. Visit sleepnumber.com to find the store near you. And be sure to tell them that Found sent you. Drunk driving fatalities are 100% preventable. And it's up to you to do your part. All it takes is for one person to give a damn to save lives. Take a lift. Get a ride. Designate a driver. Whatever you do, just care enough to get home safely whenever alcohol is involved. Your friends, family, and neighbors will all thank you for it. I'll thank you for it. A message from Budweiser reminding you to give a damn. Don't drive drunk. When you think about it, most found stories are also the story of someone losing something. That love note left behind on the bus, maybe it slipped out of someone's back pocket. That Polaroid picture you plucked up from the grass, maybe it tumbled from someone's backpack, and the wind left it there for you to discover. Anna Stothard is a novelist born and raised in London. On a visit to America when she was 10 years old, her family lost a prized, really kind of irreplaceable possession. Her story is about how losing something can actually help you find something even more important. I gripped my father's hand as he tugged me through an aisle of ringing Las Vegas slot machines. We made our way across the jumbled casino floor towards the concierge desk, peering under jangling roulette tables and between gamblers' pale ankles, both of us searching desperately for a plump, and currently missing stuffed bear named Christmas Ted. Dad always walked fast, and I was in the petulant habit of leaning back on his hand to slow his pace, trying to remind him of my existence. We were a little shy in each other's company then. He was a political journalist and rare book enthusiast, while I was a ten-year-old My Little Pony enthusiast, so we never seemed to have a great deal of common ground. He struck me as oversized and remote, like some sort of walking corduroy tree or a curious species of bearded animal that I didn't understand. That day, though, we were united by our mutual love of a bear with an embroidered cotton nose and black marble eyes sewn into his head at a jaunty angle so that he had a constant expression of nervous energy. Even in the blistering Nevada heat, Christmas Ted wore a vivid red and green sweater slightly frayed at the edges and covered with souvenir badges of destinations we'd hit on our family road trip that summer. A museum in Yosemite National Park, a diner on Route 66, and a gift shop badge of a redwood tree silhouetted against a setting sun. Christmas Ted was the best friend and one true love of my brother Michael, a careful, empathetic eight-year-old who had an uncanny knack for picking up on people's emotions and the perceived emotions of inanimate objects. Later, Michael became a talented poker player, presumably because of his sensitivity, but also perhaps as a result of his early introduction to Vegas casinos. That day, he was just a devastated child crying for his bear in a hotel room, though, and Dad and I were the rescue team sent out to save the day. As we neared the concierge desk, I struggled free of Dad's engulfing hand and ran through a fake medieval stone arch. "'Have you seen a teddy bear? We've lost him,' I said to one of the ladies behind the desk." Nothing has been handed in, she replied with a slow drawl. Is there a lost property room, Dad asked. Yeah, she said reluctantly. Perhaps in such a present tense city devoid of clocks, the idea of lost property implied a past or future that nobody wanted to concede. I imagined a dungeon where they kept the lost souls of all those sad-eyed people stationed at the slot machines. Downstairs, the concierge suggested at last. Basement floor on your right, I think. Dad tried to take my hand again, but I snatched it back and strode off towards the elevator. Please don't be difficult, Dad said to me with a sigh. Of course not, I replied haughtily, deflecting his gaze. We were becoming increasingly edgy, thinking of the tears and the horror that would ruin the rest of our holiday if Christmas Ted couldn't be found. 
Dad and I went down the elevator to a dank basement hallway with a speckled plaster ceiling and egg-coloured walls. There were no signs, but after several wrong turns we found a door marked lost and found and stepped through into a large, uninhabited storage room. Dad hit the light switch and the pinkish fluorescent bulbs overhead revealed a scene unlike anything I'd ever seen before or have ever seen since. Perhaps it was partly my smallness, but the room seemed vast, the size of a hockey rink filled with endless treasure troves of lost toys and broken costumes. There was a feathered, sequined leotard and two wedding dresses hanging from the ceiling, a mosaic salad bowl brimming over with car keys, a pair of crutches, a row of lonely single shoes, and a thousand dolls of every conceivable size. There were limbless and naked Barbie dolls like an army of Venus de Milo's. There were rag dolls with missing eyes, worry dolls the size of rice grains, and floppy cabbage patch kids with cottony stuffing spilling from their ripped knees. I felt sick with excitement at the sight of this magic chamber, and Dad looked equally amazed. We saw a huge box of teddy bears. It was an army, a universe. Ones with button-down jackets, ones with little felt suitcases and top hats. Dozens of gaudy creatures that had been won in fairgrounds. But as we went through them, we realised that none of them were our Ted. Dad's face fell, and so did mine. I guess we'll try again tomorrow, Dad said. We were about to turn and leave when I saw a rainbow-coloured beach bag perched on a high metal shelf and noticed a familiar paw sticking out of it. Michael always held Ted's left paw and the right paw was worn from often being dragged along pavements and carpets. Up there, I pointed. That's not our bag, Dad replied. Inside the bag, I said. Dad reluctantly lifted me up under the arms to let me pluck down the bag from its shelf. Sure enough, inside the bag, limbs akimbo, squeezed between a Nevada guidebook and a disposable waterproof camera, was a befuddled-looking Christmas Ted. Well done, Anna, Dad said with genuine excitement. He kissed me, his beard tickly. I grinned at the pleasure of success and the thrill of being kissed. I also noticed that his eyes were exactly the same colour as mine. Dad and I went for celebratory milkshakes, We'd saved Christmas Ted from the macabre world of Vegas lost property, and I remember sitting opposite Dad, feeling utterly content, knowing that he couldn't have found Ted without me. Later that night, Mum joined us back at our hotel. She held Ted affectionately on her lap. Where'd you find him? she asked. Anna found him at the Lost and Found, Dad shrugged, as if there was nothing more to note about our afternoon. For a moment, I felt stricken, Perhaps, I thought, the experience hadn't been as magic or memorable for Dad. I looked nervously up at him. Then, for the first time ever, he winked at me. The lost and found room was our secret. That was Anna Stothard. Anna's one of my favorite writers. One of my favorite people on the planet, actually. And she's got a new novel out in November called The Museum of Kathy about a girl who collects a museum of objects that tell the story of her life. You can pre-order it now. And you can see a picture of Christmas Ted on that fateful trip to Las Vegas on our Facebook page. Back with more in just a moment. This week on Found, we're exploring found stories, the ways a found item can surprise us, scare us, excite us, even change the way we see the world. Most of the found stories people share with us are notes, letters, photos, and other items that once belonged to a stranger. They give us a glimpse into the life of someone we'd otherwise never have known. But our next story is a little different. Beth Min Nguyen is a writer living in San Francisco, but she grew up in Michigan, and her story is about something she found in her own childhood home. She calls the piece, How I Found My Mother. I must have been snooping through boxes in my parents' house because there was no other way I would have found the photograph. This was 1995 or maybe 1994. It may have been summer or winter break, me on a brief visit home from college. 
I know my father was renovating the house then because he's always renovating. Drywall always half done, tiles stilled in their push across the kitchen floor. In my parents' house, nothing is ever really thrown away, and every drawer turns into a junk drawer. There's a closet where we simply throw things, broken hangers, chewed up dog toys, and slam the door shut. Better not to look. But I can picture my college self, alone in that never-done house, picking through the plastic bins my stepmother had stuffed with years of papers and receipts, and then finding what I had never even searched for, a photograph of my mother. On April 29, 1975, the night before Saigon fell, my family left Vietnam. We fled, my father and uncles and grandmother and sister and I, with literally the clothes on our backs. I was eight months old. At the time, my father and mother were separated, and she was living with her family in a different part of the city. My father had no way to get in touch with her and no time to go after her. So we left. We were gone before she knew it. We took a chance because we had no other chance. We hoped for luck and got it. Meaning, I grew up in the Midwest, in Michigan, in a family that never spoke of topics like sex or the war. I grew up with sitcoms that resolved problems just before the credits rolled, in a time of tapered pants and Aquanet hairspray. I grew up with a stepmother and a grandmother. I grew up hardly thinking about my real mother at all. There is no good way to tell this story. It tends to elicit shock and pity. It is uncomfortably dramatic, and yet people always want it to be more dramatic. Because, in truth, I never questioned my father. I didn't ask who or where my mother was, didn't go looking through his room. It was easier not to seek and not to find. But then my mother found me. She made it to the United States on her own and sent my sister and me a letter. When I finally met my mother in Boston, where she had landed a few years before, I was 20 years old. What did I expect? I didn't know. I knew nothing about my mother until the moment I saw her and she said, geez, you are so late. We went out for dim sum and walked around Chinatown and bought mooncakes. Nervous, I talked about the Boston Tea Party. She asked me about school, and we agreed that education in general was a very fine thing. We were on our best behavior, like two people on a blind date. Let's stay in touch, we said. Later that year, or the year after, I must have snooped through my parents' boxes, though I don't remember it. And that's when I found her, my mother, in a black and white photograph taken when she was young in Vietnam. She is posed outside a stone house near an open window, in a satin flowered gown with three-quarter sleeves and a flaring skirt. Her hair is pulled back in a near beehive updo. I don't know if I'd been born yet. Maybe my father took the picture and kept it all that time, crossing the world between Vietnam and Michigan, and all those years in which no one ever spoke of my mother. What does it mean when you forget how you found something? It means you want to have had it all along. It means you don't want to think about the loss that precedes the finding. Such a story, my mother said once, over the phone, when I asked her how she and my father had first met. Oh, she said, why would you want to know that? I asked her if she remembered the photograph. No idea, she said. But do I look pretty? At home in Michigan, my father is on a constant quest to get as big of a television as he can afford. A 40-inch screen is, in his opinion, paltry. It's settling. We settle down onto the old puffy leather sofas to watch the action movies he loves. The half-painted living room fills with images of machine guns waving and spraying, knives slashing, fists hitting their mark. Cars smash onto sidewalks, fly in slow-motion arcs through the air. It's late at night. It's 1994, or maybe 1995. It's last year, last summer, last month. My father and I watch TV. The volume is so loud, there is no place in the house free of gunfire and grenades. On the television screen, precision battle, blood, 
Cha cha, my father exclaims. Holy wow. Later, he will fall asleep to these same scenes, unwilling to let the movie end or the television rest. Let's see it again, he'll say the next day, reaching for the remote control. I want to know how to pull back the days that have slipped from my grasp. I want to talk to my father, explain that I had to find that photograph in order to find her, to allow the portrait of her past into my present life. But he and I don't speak in such ways. I may never know if he knows I have this photograph, this document of the story we share. In his favorite movies, there is little dialogue, and the heroes have perfect balance. They fling themselves from building to building as if they already know they're safe, that the resolution, the soft shore of the fade to black, is already waiting to welcome them into that beckoning landscape where all the avenues point forward. That was Beth Min Nguyen. Her excellent memoir about growing up as a Vietnamese immigrant in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is called Stealing Buddha's Dinner. You know, I just love hearing all the kinds of ways that the simple act of finding something has affected someone. It could be helping your brother find his teddy bear and in the process growing closer to your dad. It could be having a much-needed laugh on a really tough day. Or even a photo that gives you insight into your journey from childhood to where you are today. So if you have found stories to share with us, we'd love to hear them. Send us a message on our Facebook page, on the Found iOS app, or drop us an email, and we might use your story in a future episode. That's our show for this week, but we'll be back with another episode in two weeks with a little update in between. If you're digging the Found podcast, please do us a favor and recommend your favorite episode of the show to a friend, or leave us a review on iTunes. We're super grateful for any help you can give in spreading the word. It really makes a difference. Found is also a print magazine. To order copies and also check out a ton more finds, check out the Found Magazine website, foundmagazine.com. Don't forget, tickets are on sale now for the Found Musical. Find the link on our Facebook page. Meanwhile, I'm going to be at the Now Hear This podcast festival in Anaheim, California at the end of October with a bunch of other amazing podcasts like Comedy Bang Bang, WTF with Mark Marin, and The Moth. Come see a live taping of our show. You can get a discount on a three-day pass with the code FOUND. Go to nowhearthisfest.com. The Found Podcast is produced by the wondrous Julia Smith and myself. Our editor is the block rockin' Milos Zivkovic at Union Editorial. Executive producers are Victoria Lang, Jamie Salka, and Eva Price for Found the Musical, and Adrian Becker for Killer Films Media. Found comes to you from Wondery and their family of shows. Check them out at wondery.com. Ben Adair is our special consultant, Lee Overtree our consulting producer, and Eli Bolin our music director. Additional music by the Watson Twins, Intall Buildings, IMIC, Tally Hall, Shaheen Seth. Our associate producer is Gordon Ampel, and our additional editor is the awesome Thomas Matisic. Thanks to the Found Magazine team, Sarah Locke, Brandy Wicks, Al McWilliams, James Melinda, and Tariq McRae, and everyone at Found Headquarters. Thanks to our finders from today's episode, Anna Stothard, Beth Nguyen, Jenny Owen Youngs, and Lori Cavello. And thanks most of all to you for listening. You're cordially invited to, well, you know. All right then, peace. Do something witchy was the last thing Charles Manson said to his followers the night he sent them out to slaughter five people at the home of director Roman Polanski and actress Sharon Tate. But how did a troubled kid from West Virginia become Charles Manson? Join me, Tracy Patton, and Stephen Lang from the hit films Avatar and Don't Breathe in Young Charlie as we journey into the mind of one of the most infamous murderers ever to stalk Hollywood. Subscribe to Young Charlie on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now.